Do you have a, a theme song or anything? Um, I do. It's it's not too long, but it's just gonna sort of roll in. Okay. Um, Greg Willits. Sam Barron. Welcome to my show. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here. Did, did you realize that you've already created a a uh, regular beginning to your show that you say the person's name and by default the person says your name right back? Have you noticed that on your show? I've gone back and watched. I've, really? I've done my research. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the start of the start of how you do it. It's like you say the person's name and that they say say a Baron right back at you. That's really helpful for people who have no idea who I am yeah. and then start the show. That's it. Yeah. Um we're in a very different environment. Um we are in your studio. We are. Um this is a very nice studio. Thank you. It's been 20 years in the making. Wow. What's the how much just time looking for stuff to put in it do you did you spend well if you see the this no we've recorded a couple things the the pictures that are hanging back there Mm -hmm. i've had those framed for months now and i literally just got them hung this week i finally Mm. said we're gonna have uh an in-studio guest next week and i said we got we just i have to pull the trigger you know Mm -hmm. sometimes you just overthink these things you just go for so long but thinking about it I mean, it, it's been a long time. It was last August, all of a sudden, we had this room finished off. And the vision of this, you know, it goes back. It, it truly goes back years. I mean, for mm-hmm. years, we've wanted to have a dedicated recording space. Um, when we moved to Colorado, and I don't think I didn't get a chance to show you all when you came out and visited, at the Archdiocese there, I did something similar, I had a much bigger space that I, I was given use of, and I told I could knock everything down, and we had contractors come in and fancy it up. And wow. I hired a guy, um, uh, Jason Taylor, who I still stay in contact with, uh, who's just an amazing, amazing um, all-around uh, video computer technician. He does he does the motion capture suits, and he's created children's Catholic children's programs and that kind of thing. Really amazing stuff. Um, but he ran that that studio for me, and we did we did some pretty amazing things with with the very limited resources that we had. Started doing it again for the job I had after that. Bought a lot of equipment, and and we were setting things up, and didn't get to finish that. So I feel like I'm, you know, this is the first time where the vision that I've tried on multiple other occasions has has finally started to to come together, and uh, we're we're recording a lot. And the difficulty is is just. Uh, having time to edit everything mm-hmm. it's really easy to record everything <laughs> yeah but just yeah, like yeah. i literally have um my wife jennifer and i well you know jennifer but for your audience's sake my wife mm-hmm. she and i have been recording um all these prayers that go in this book here and there's 33 days of preparation and so we're doing 33 days of prayers but then we're doing a commentary and reflection for every day and i think oh, yesterday yeah. we, we did day 31 so double that right uh-huh. i already have 62 videos i need to edit <laughs> That are going to be going on on our website, and uh-huh. and uh, so it's just it's a lot of stuff, and but and we have so many ideas, we want to do more and more and more and more. Um, so it's pretty exciting. We're, I feel very um, blessed. It's just taken a long time to just say, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, and not not looking for, not always looking for uh, backup plans. Mm-hmm. That was kind of. You know, my dad is a kid who's always like, oh, always got to have multiple irons in the fire. Make mm-hmm. sure you have multiple irons in the fire. And I'm like, but I just want that one iron. <laughs> and he's like, well, you know, so I, I've, I've grown up with this fear that if I'm not trying to do multiple things at once, mm-hmm. that it's going to somehow come back and I'm going to be punished yeah. if I don't do it. Um, and, you know, I'm 52 now and I finally am realizing, or you just really focus on the, on thing, one. On the thing that makes the most sense and is the most important and... Just deal with the fallout if mm-hmm. it doesn't work out, you know. So, anyway. So your company, Rosary Army. Yeah. Um, I. I never hear it called a company. That's funny. <laughs> Is it an LLC? No, it's a it's a uh, it's a non- nonprofit. Yeah, it's a five hundred one c three nonprofit organization. So. So, what I my image of it because because you've known my parents since longer than I've been around. Um, my, That's not true. I think you were like a year when we met. Really? Yeah. Oh. I think I think you were around. I'm pretty sure you were around. Maybe you were just born. I yeah, met, I met yeah, your dad yeah. in the summer of 2006. Oh yeah, yeah. I'd what? be like one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, my image of Rosary Army was just boxes and boxes of rosary stuff, and then a bunch of like s- 
spun, how do you say that? Knotted rosaries. Yeah, yeah. And then. So when you say it's your image, it's not what you imagined. This is what, no, this you're is you're what I about, saw. You have what yeah, you yeah, saw. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> explain funny. the whole, all of what Rosary Army is. No. All of it? I mean, <laughs> so, some of it. Okay. Um, I can tell you how it started. Mm-hmm. Um, I tell the story. I feel like I tell the story every single week. Um, in the summer of 2002, I went to confession and no one was in line when I when I arrived on a Saturday afternoon. And so I walked right in and the, the priest uh, was sitting there and he had this single decade knotted rosary. But it wasn't like the kind of twine that we use now. It was like this really thick uh, parachute jump rope. Mm-hmm. But I remember just seeing it as I sat down and uh, thought, oh, that's kind of cool. And then I confessed my sins, gave absolution. I walked out and I didn't think about it again. And it wasn't until um, literally like two months later in September of 2002. And I was working in the IT industry. And your dad always makes fun of me whenever I say when I used to work in the <laughs> IT industry. That's like one of my catchphrases apparently. But I spent 10 years you know, doing software development stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was sitting in my cube and I... For no reason whatsoever, I remember that rosary, and I just was overwhelmed with this compulsion. I, I needed to learn how to make one of those things. And, you know, I like to paint and write, but I've never considered myself a very crafty guy, mm-hmm. you know? So getting twine and making things with my fingers, it wasn't something that I, you know, <laughs> I endeavored to do. Uh-huh. But I um, I went to, like, every store. I went to Hobby Lobby. I went to Michael's. I went to, like, every hobby store and every fabric store I could find. And no one had this this particular type of twine. It's number 36 nylon twine. And so I went to uh, – I finally gave in. I just bought this – do you know what macrame is? It was a big thing in the 70s. Mm-mm. Look up macrame owls. Macrame owls. You will find – you, you will probably find some great parody websites talking about how <laughs> how weird the seventies were. Uh-huh. But it's like so it's like twine and you, it's you know kind of like knitting, but it's not. You're making these weird designs with this thick cord. And, and I mean, ho- every home in the seventies had a macrame owl hanging on the walls. This is a flat owl <laughs> that's like knit with like two bulbous brown like wood eyes and then you'd just go out in your backyard and find a stick and then you'd, you'd, you'd knit these feet on it uh-huh. and, you, and then you put one at the top too to hang it and you say hey it's just i'm, I'm i gotta show you hold on i mean it's like so you type in macrame owl and, and people at home can can uh, do the same thing i'm, yes, I'm telling yeah, you yeah. i'm telling you i've never googled this before you're, you're, you're gonna see a thousand of these okay. I, I can guarantee it so right away there you go, macrame owls. Oh yeah, I've seen those. You see before. these? Yeah. This right there. Look at that on Etsy. You could buy one now for thirty nine dollars. But I mean, just look. I mean, they're just they all look like this one. Uh huh. So anyway, so I, I used macrame twine or macrame cord, and I made my first rosary, and it was just. I tell people, I said it was the ugliest rosary you've ever seen. It was just <laughs> that it, and I think we have one of the first ones I made downstairs. But I, I just was kind of hooked. I mean, I, when I finished that first one, and then I started giving them away to people like almost immediately. Mm-hmm. And my son Ben had was like six months old at the time, and we went to the beach like a week or two after I started making these things. And we're at the beach, and I remember so clearly like we're walking down the beach, and and you know either me or Jennifer had Ben like you know straddled in the little whatever it is the pompoose or whatever it's called. Other kids running around, and I'm on the beach. You know, at sunset, making the rosary, and I got like 20 feet of twine dangling in the wind behind me. But I just, uh-huh. I, I couldn't stop making these things and just kept giving them away, giving them away. So, so the, the reason why I kept honing in on September of 2002 is something really important happened the next month. I, I felt like, so here's this new thing I found. I was, I'm making rosaries. It's all about me. You know, it's this my thing that I'm mm-hmm. doing. Well, then the very next month, October of 2002, uh, Pope St. John Paul II declared the year of the rosary. Mm. And he released a letter in October of that year called Rosarium Virginis Mariae, kind of like trying to reinfuse the rosary into our culture again. And he added the Loomis Mysteries of the Rosary at that time. So the, the, oh, those, haven't wow. been, those haven't been around very long. They've only yeah. been around for 22 years. And I, I remember I had never been so excited before for something out of the church because it's like my faith was kind of waking up as I was doing this. You know, mm-hmm. so it had already been there. I had this faith in Jesus, but it's like my, my faith in Catholicism and understanding Catholicism and diving deeply into Catholicism and understanding I'd never had a devotion to the rosary before. I mm-hmm. never really understood it. And, uh, you know, so 
when that letter came out, I literally, I, there was rumors of it the day before, and I literally jumped out of bed that morning and <laughs> ran across the room because we didn't have the cell phones yet, right? We uh-huh. had we had the computers that were hardwired, and you had to still do dial in, or mm-hmm. dial up, but right? So I'm like going in and we're connecting to the Vatican, <laughs> and then there was this letter, and I was just so I was so excited. This really happened because I felt like I felt like God was doing something in my life. Yeah, I mean, it's like that timing, that timing was was unexplainable. Mm-hmm. Why would why would I after all these years all of a sudden have this compulsion to make rosaries and start doing them like the month before? All right, so then fast forward, I kept doing this over the next few months and it just made more and more and more and more of them. And I'm like begging Jennifer, I'm like, can I have eight more dollars to buy another spool of twine? <laughs> you know, and we had a little basket back in our closet that I could I only had like two spools, or two colors at a time, and a pair of scissors and a little cigarette lighter, and that was the start of Rosary Army. But I was asked to go on um, as a as a um, chaperone for a teen retreat in March of 2003. Mm-hmm. And they asked me to give a talk about John Paul II, his love of Mary and of the rosary. And so um, I gave this talk and it was completely unplanned. And I told the story that I just told you just now. And I said, you know, at first there was this feeling that it was all about me. And then I realized it's not all about me. It's about Jesus. And it's like, I all of a sudden felt like there's other people doing rosary related things and the world needs the rosary. And I felt like I was a part of an army. It was just a throwaway comment. I, I totally didn't plan it. It was spontaneous. And, and honestly, I forgot I even said it once I said it. Uh-huh. Except I, that was the first time I taught a group of teens how to make these rosaries. And I taught them the basic knots, gave them a piece of scrap. They got that down. And once they figured it out and showed me their knots, I'd give them a full you know, length of twine. And they went off and they were making the rosaries. And all weekend long, these, these um, teens who were, you know, at the time were your age and are now – in their 30s, you mm-hmm. know, and have families and everything, which is really wild to me. Um, it makes me feel kind of old. <laughs> um, all weekend long, they'd come up to me with their finished rosaries and say, look, I'm in the army now. Look, I'm in the <laughs> army now. And driving home that night, I realized what we need to do. And that night, I got home and I went online. And it was literally 20 years ago this week. Wow. That rosaryarmy.com went online. Dang. And I registered the URL and I put up a simple website. And, and the idea was I... I said, if you want a free rosary, I'll send you one free rosary, print out this form, mail it to this address. You literally used to have people sitting it to our home address because I was like, no one's ever going to see this. And, and what could go bad if you put your home address on the internet? Uh-huh. I mean, you know, that could never that could never uh, backfire on you. Uh, and about two weeks later, this, this dude named Steve in Texas, <laughs> a guy in Texas named Steve, who's now a deacon. Wow. Um, sent a request. He was the first one to ever send a request for a rosary. And... Uh, Steve D. Uh, actually, got a chance. To, he came to Atlanta a, a couple years later, and I went. You picked, met him. I went and picked him up at the airport or at his hotel. I brought him back to our house. We made tacos, and and uh, <laughs> I mean, it's like this is the, this this guy with us was a celebrity. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that was the start of Rosemary, right? So that was that was twenty years ago this month. Well, for the first couple of years, I'm still in the IT industry. I don't know what I'm. You know, we're just. I, People said, well, is this what you do for a living? I'm like, well, how do you give stuff away for free and support a family? It's like it didn't uh-huh. make sense that you could do that, right? And so I never had any any desire, any thought whatsoever that um, it was going to become something that I would do for a living. And I actually at the time, I was like, you know, I, I was applying for uh, like archdiocesan jobs. Like mm-hmm. I, I applied at Georgia Bulls and they had a webmaster position. I applied, you know, it just but it's like the, the pay was so low. It still is so low. I mean, to work for the church, you're not going to make – a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, hey, I wasn't a good decision and that kind of thing. So um, it, then then this is when, you know, the, the impact on your parents happens was in 2004, the fall of 2004. So two years later, um, technology changed drastically, suddenly mm-hmm. in the world. And, you know, every few years, and it seems like it happens less and less, even though technology is rapidly, you know, Changing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like what well, we have these things now. Technology, there will be some new thing that gets everyone's attention for two weeks. Yeah, and it kind of that you know. But but it was significant, and it was in early two thousand and five when I first heard about it. But um, that's when this idea of podcasting came about, and no one had ever even heard of a podcast in the Catholic sphere. Mm-hmm. There were a couple youth ministers that were doing it. Um, you know. Uh, Father Roderick over in the Netherlands, he he was experimenting with it, but there were no no Catholic parishes, dioceses, the Vatican, 
any Catholic organizations, not a single one of them had even heard of podcasting yet. I had a conversation with Catholic Answers, a huge, huge Catholic ministry, and that would have been in that would have been in two thousand and five or six when I had that conversation with them, and I talked to them about podcasting. And uh, uh, no, it was oh six because we were going to a, a podcasting conference out there in California. Mm. They weren't even aware of it. Now they're huge in podcasting. You know, it's like and so um, it was in March of two thousand and five. So eighteen years ago this month uh, was when we launched our first podcast, and it was literally me. And I had, you know, I had an old HP computer, and I don't know if you you could look these up too. You'd have like these long sticks, those maybe about that long, look like a straw with a little nubby on the end of it, and a wire. Uh huh. That was your microphone, <laughs> and it's like and anything you touched on it would go clang clang. You'd hear that in the audio, and it just sounded like you're talking through a tin can. Mm -hmm. But that was they those came with the computers back then. Oh, so it's interesting. Like, you know, and so I'm like I'm talking through that at first, and then. I, I did a couple of shows, and to this day, my wife, who you know has done hundreds and hundreds of shows with me, thousands of hours of of recording, she's never listened to the first show. She's <laughs> never she's never heard them. But I, I recorded it, and at first, I thought it was going to be like, you know, just for Rosary Army. So it was the Rosary Army Catholic podcast, and so you know, I can I can legitimately, um, you know, put my flag in the in the ground and say Rosary Army was the very first Catholic organization in the world to right. use podcasting. Interesting. And so it was before it, Apple had not even added it to iTunes yet. Oh wow! It, they had the iPod was out, the original, you know, the little the white one with the click wheel, but it wasn't in there. And it was about two months after I think that they added that functionality mm. uh, so that you could actually have a podcast tab, and that's what kind of propelled us a little bit because th there were just a handful of Catholic podcasters at that time. Mm -hmm. And if you went into iTunes and you typed in Catholic, ours was one of the first couple that came up. I mean, every time. Yeah. Um, and now it's like, now our show is buried, buried, buried. You know, get, you just see Father Mike Schmitz, Father Mike Schmitz, uh -huh. Father Mike Schmitz, you know, uh -huh. uh, and his various enterprises. Um, but we have people that still listen to us now that were with us at the very beginning. So that's, wow. all that stuff was kind of like, that That was the the beginning. We didn't, we never imagined that Rosary Army would be a media thing, right? Never imagined that it, this would mm -hmm. that come from all of it. Um, so that's the, that's the beginning of it. But it's like to say, all of what we've done. I mean, we've done. We did a we did a video series uh, that we we used YouTube because it was more like YouTube was like a, um, uh, it was like it was like uh, th this is a folder that we could put these videos that people could access. <laughs> like, that, that's kind of how uh -huh. we, we looked at YouTube and oh, and I think it was in two thousand and seven when we launched that first series. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you know, my first video, I mean, we don't know what we're doing. I did one about making California roll sushi. And it's like, <laughs> and that video has like 90,000 views on it. And, wow. and, and it's like, it was, and it literally was like our friend Father Roderick was holding up my laptop that had a, a camera built in <laughs> and filmed the whole thing, you uh -huh. know, backwards. And he's like holding it, you know, and anyway, so, I mean, we did a, we did a lot of experimentation in the first few years of just like, well, what, what works? And we made that video series and that that propelled us in different directions and you know just the various stuff that we did got um got visibility uh just at the right time i can't explain it the cnmc the catholic new media conference mm. how did that start so th th and that's interesting as well so the 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 first idea i've always wanted to do a rosary army retreat mm -hmm. and bring together all these people that are impacted by Rosary Army and have them, you know, all come together and meet each other and, and hang out with us and grow in our faith. That was always kind of I've always wanted to do that, and and, and I still think it's going to happen someday. I just haven't had a clear vision of it. And at that time, not only were we doing uh, back in this would have been like oh. 06. So at the end of 06, we we did our first major, major giving campaign and raised enough money that um, I, I left my – I resigned from my IT job and started working full-time for Rosary Army. But it wasn't just Rosary Army. It was Rosary Army and another nonprofit we started mm. called SQPN, the StarQuest Production Network. And that was with Father Roderick. That was his uh, uh, brainchild. But he didn't have – sort of the business experience that Jennifer and I had already developed. And we established Rosary Army as a nonprofit in the United States. And so it, it was a good partnership. Father Roderick was kind of the face, and Jennifer and I were running things behind the scenes a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we we were talking with a lot of other creators at the time. And there was a, a, a group of of, um, of guys who a couple of them were priests. One of them was a layperson. Who, I think that layperson's a deacon now. But they did a show called Catholic Underground, and they had an idea of doing sort of a um, a Catholic – um, meetup type thing as well. 
And we were talking about doing the Rosie Army thing, and but we also with SQPN we were saying, well, but it would make more sense if it's not just a Rosie Army retreat, but it's an SQPN thing. What does that look like? We had a conversation with them, and and you know just sort of brainstormed ideas, and I think we had different ideas, and then we, you know, Father Roderick and I were talking, it's like we we can do this this conference here in Atlanta. We had um, connections that you know from people that were doing the Eucharistic Congress, which is a huge conference here in mm-hmm. Atlanta every year. And maybe we could sort of piggyback on that. And then we went and talked to those other guys and said, do you, you know, do you care if we do this? And they said, no, go for it. And I, I tell you what, um, so I, it pretty much was something that, that, I mean, Father Roderick was in the Netherlands. So his, his ability to, to, you know, be there and do stuff was limited. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of the onus fell on me to find the people who could help make it happen and, and arrange the the program and, you know, plan the day. And my sister helped, you know, secure the contract for the venue and all that kind of stuff. And, and my idea, I, I, you know, I have a hard time charging money for things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, especially when it comes to faith-based things and, and I really wanted it to be a free thing. I wanted people to be able to just come and learn and be there and experience this. And so we made it completely free. We got it. We got like I think about twenty thousand dollars in sponsors. Wow! That again, that was something else I was doing. Was just like, do you want to be a sponsor? You want to be a sponsor? You want to be a sponsor to pay yeah. for the venue, pay for all the stuff. The, you know, we gave away a lot of freebies and that kind of thing that day. Hired a you know full audio video crew. I mean, it was a, it was a big deal. Uh-huh. Um, and and uh, you know what's funny is a lesson came from this, and I actually wrote about that in, in um, one of my books. Was I was doing so many things, and, I, and and it's sort of like a cautionary tale for myself now because I'm I do so many things mm-hmm. that I have to try to not do as much as I want, and I need to get help. I need to find help because I literally, um, like one day, I mean, I was again, I was doing, I was doing interviews promoting this thing. I was, you know, doing the the plane tickets for the speakers that were coming. I mean, I was literally just doing every little minutia. Yeah. I still have the graphics files from the from the name <laughs> tags. I did, I figured out how I did the name tags and then I did a mail merge for all the people's names. It's like you know, I, every I printed all. I, it yeah, was just, yeah, yeah. But I say all that to say, um, a buddy of mine used to own a coffee coffee house, and I used to go to his coffee house, and, and I'd sit at a table in the back and get a lot of work done. And I and I showed up one day and I sat down and I opened up my computer. And then I started looking at my stuff, and I'm and I'm and I'm reading, you know, like emails that I sent the day before, and I suddenly realized I had no memory <laughs> at all of the day before. Uh huh. I, I was kind of frying my brain. Yeah. And it was kind of terrifying. And, you know, my daughter, my daughter's name is Lily. Her namesake is my great aunt Lou, who died from Alzheimer's disease, and it was just a terif- terrible thing to watch. You know, my aunt, my, it was actually my great aunt, my mom's aunt. She was a huge influence on my life Mm -hmm. and uh i remember one time when i was like in elementary school and every day for about three weeks we got the exact same postcard in the mail from her (laughs) can't wait to see you i love you all so much you know when you come up to visit Uh next day love you all so much can't wait to see you i mean she just she didn't remember she sent the postcard so she just kept sending the same postcard Mm -hmm. and i remember telling my mom i was like oh you know when we see her i gotta tell her you keep sending us the same postcard my mom was like don't say anything (laughs) it's like uh, you know that'll make her so sad Uh because you know alzheimer's is such a sad thing but yeah when i when i i I started googling you know because that's what you do right you start looking online you know for like early onset alzheimer's i really thought i thought i thought something had snapped Uh um that i i I could not remember that and you know i have i have a tendency towards anxiety and that kind of thing and and that was that was a scary thing so anyway that the cnmc it it Came off without a hitch, and mm-hmm. it was one of the coolest things. Um, all these people, we had people from sort of like what was what we used to refer to as the old media, TV and radio, together with new media, podcasting and blogs and you know whatever we could do, be doing online, and bringing them all together. And and the CNMC continued for several years. Um, that was the only one that I ran. I ended up uh, resigning um, from SQPN uh, about a month later because we uh, were offered a radio job and that was going to take all my time mm-hmm. and uh but i attended a few more i even got to MC uh the one in kansas and uh it's a it's a great thing i wish it had continued because the thing i loved about it and even though eventually they necessarily needed to start charging tickets and that kind of thing it was uh it was an important thing for catholic media creators to be able to come together because at first i envisioned it being both the listeners and the creators and the listeners still showed up 
but really people who are trying to figure out how do we do this ministry, this mm-hmm. this medium ministry type stuff for God. How do we do this? What are you doing? What's working? And just to be encouraged and have some fellowship. And and some of the best friends uh, that I have in my life uh, came from that period of SQPN and the CNMC and doing those kinds of things. Your folks are, you know, uh, fruit of that, yeah. you know, of of that that community that existed then. And now Catholic podcasters, most of us don't know the, the existence of each other because there's so many Catholic podcasts yeah. out there. And and there's no one, you know, I think there's a lot of suspicion. It's like, well, I'm trying to build up my show and have my platform. <laughs> it's like, it's like, well, is it about a platform or is it about, you know, a ministry and serving God? And yeah. so it's, it's, and it's, and let me, and let me be honest. I mean, it's a difficult thing. I mean, I get jealous all the time and I, mm-hmm. and I have to go to confession and say, I, you know, I got jealous of this media creator or whatever. And, um, you know, but it's, it's, I don't know. I, I miss that community. I, I miss it very much. And um, but I do still consider the people that I still talk to a lot of those people. You know, um, you know, the, there was a neurosurgeon. I don't know if you hear your parents talk about Dr. Paul Camerata. He was a part of it. He used to do a show called The Saint Cast. Still oh, stay. Wow. I still stay in contact with Paul, Captain Jeff, uh, airline pilot. I have I, heard of yeah, Captain I, Jeff. I still, yeah. t- I just, I mean, both those guys I've communicated with just in the last month. Father Jay Finelli, the I Padre. I talked to him just last week. You know, so it's like you know, the, you know, I still have to talk to your parents every once in a while. But, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, yeah. but um, you know, it's just it was. I talked to Father Roderick every once in a while, but again, he's in the Netherlands and it's hard to stay in contact. But and I still, I still talk to the guy who now runs SQPN, Don Bettinelli, mm. um, who's a who's a great guy, and he's, uh, you know, it's it's neat to see it going in different and new directions. And is there a another kind of conference like that? Mm-mm. Like there is the Eucharistic Congress, but there's yeah. no sort of not, not, not in that area that would specifically tie into for podcasters and uh, video and 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 online uh, content creators, and and I think that there is a place for it. I really do. Um, and I've thought many times of Rosary Army doing something like that, but uh, out of respect to the guys at SQPN, who even though they they aren't doing it. I, th- I think that they still mull over how could they do it, mm-hmm. and it's a lot of work. It really is. It's a tremendous amount of work, and I don't. I don't know if it's. I mean, I think the idea of you know just because you would like to have something happen doesn't necessarily mean it should. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And so I, I miss the community because I miss. I miss you know I miss my friends right. So you, mm-hmm. I want to bring. I want to get the band back together, <laughs> uh, but but that doesn't necessarily mean it's it's God's will for that to happen. So yeah. Um, you said Lily was named after your yeah. great great aunt Lil. Great aunt Lil. Yeah. Is is any of your other kids named after? Sh- no. no. No, just her. No. You know the stories of all the kids' names, right? I don't. Are you serious? Yeah. Sam Baron, how do you not know that? <laughs> you know some of them, though, right? I I think if you started to say it, okay. I would be like, oh yeah, I remember that one. So in in college, I was um, and and. I go back and forth. I, I've always been very intrigued by Ernest Hemingway mm. um, and read a lot of bios of his. And he's not a very moral guy. <laughs> uh-huh. Married four times, you know, cheated on his wives every time, um, a bit of a drunk. But for what he just did in terms of transforming literature in the 20th century, I was always kind of amazed. And I was amazed because he was an adventurer. So, you know, I always had a an admiration for Ernest Hemingway literally just started reading sun also rises again last night. <laughs> um, and, uh, just, I, I keep getting pulled back in cause I don't know why it's just something that's interesting to me. Um, so our oldest son, um, who's 25, his name is Samuel Hemingway Willits. Really? Yeah. Sam's middle name is Hemingway, Samuel Hemingway Willits. Wow. And then I started working in the IT industry I was doing a lot of uh, software and web development work in the in the mid to late '90s and early 2000s, and uh, our son Walter was born in 2000. Oh, excuse me, 1999. Mm-hmm. And we didn't tell anyone that we we're going to do this, but uh, you know, when I when he was born, and I sent out the notice to all my coworkers and my buddy Kit, who was actually Kit, Kit and I uh, started a podcast together at the same time. So it's like we were just he 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 was all involved in, or he liked uh, southeastern college football, and so he did one about. Southeastern college football. So he and I were our first audience for each other. He doesn't know anything about Catholicism, and uh-huh. I didn't know anything about Southeastern college football. <laughs> but we literally were the only audience the other person had for the first couple episodes. Mm-hmm. But I sent an email to Kit. Kit sent out an email to the whole uh, whole audience or a whole uh, office um, about Walter's name. Walter is Walter William Willits. So his initials are WWW. <laughs> so 
1999, I was a pretty cool guy at work. People, people thought that was pretty awesome. Uh, and then Ben, you know, I, I so I, I got Hemingway and WWW, right? And so then Jennifer gets pregnant with with our third son, Ben, and, and mm-hmm. I'm like just backing off. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not even going to suggest the first. You name. named the last one after a URL. Well, Go ahead. Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, you get, you could choose whatever you want. I'm uh-huh. not saying anything. And then she just kept saying, I like Ben. I like Ben. I, I, I really like Ben. I'm, I, and then finally, like, you know, we're close to the birth, and she goes, Yeah. I definitely want him to be Ben. I said, well, you know what his middle name has to be, don't you? It's like, we can't have a Ben. So you know this, right? Yeah. So Ben's name is... Middle name is Kenobi. Yeah, Ben Kenobi (laughs) Willits. And so that's... When we got the social security card for that one, and when the government had to acknowledge that I have a child named Benjamin Kenobi. Uh So yeah, Ben Kenobi is my uh, third son. And then we started getting serious about the faith. Mm. And so Tommy got the saint named. (laughs) <laughs> T- Thomas Francis, you know, so after Francis de Sales, who's the patron saint of writers, and mm-hmm. I was trying to get a book published, and so I thought a little bit of, you know, greasing the wheels, maybe, hey, uh, St. Francis, what if I <laughs> name one of my kids after you? Never got that book published. <laughs> so I, I, I learned a lot of humility, though, so apparently saints would rather you have humility <laughs> than publishing rights to a book. Uh-huh. And then our daughter, Lily, um, was named after my my great aunt, who, she was a writer, she, was a, she, was, she wasn't Catholic, but she was a uh, very active Christian speaker. She uh, was the editor of a a Christian women's magazine, Mm. wrote several books. I have some of them over there in my storage uh, closet, Um, several books about uh, relationships with God. And so she really read any of them. um, No, no. And I've never, I'll be honest. I've never completed any of them either Mm. because they're very Lutheran. Mm -hmm. Um, But I mean, I, you know, and then downstairs, I have a couple of Aunt Lil's paintings hanging up in our oh. in our sitting room downstairs. That mm-hmm. she, and so she painted, she drew. I mean, she was very, very inspirational to me as a kid. She she definitely planted, uh, you know, some some uh, what do they call it the uh, imprinting on me. You know? uh, <laughs> she, she, uh-huh. she imprinted on me majorly, and, and you know, and I I feel like a lot of my creativity came from her. Awesome. So. Well, we will be right back after the break. Uh, maybe play some Tetris. Do you have Tetris? I do have Tetris. I love Tetris. <laughs> Is this, what was this? Is this? Am I supposed to do that? Yeah, yeah. It's like, you gotta, have you ever played The Mind? Did you play The Mind with us? I have. You gotta sync up. Okay. Oh, that's that sounds like, yeah, okay. I remember your dad doing that. I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not gonna it's, do this. it's part of the this, game. This new agey, whatever it is that you're doing, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna <laughs> this do is that. definitely pagan. There's a level of this that's yeah. either heretical or pagan. So nice. Um, and we're back from from a very long, very exhausting break. Um, as in, I went downstairs and got more water, and I just reached over <laughs> and used my carafe to fill up my coffee. You have the exact same carafe that we have, or do you have the exact same carafe <laughs> that I have? Um, is there a, do you have like OBS on here where you can share your screen? I have Ecamm. Um, and so I'd have to record that separately, but I can do that. All right. Cause I was thinking instead of playing Tetris, we could, wow, you got me excited for Tetris. <laughs> I mean, we could do a bunch of different ones, like look up an emulator online. Okay. Well, so then the, the rest of the videos go, Ooh, uh, I need to reset. Uh, I need to restart my computer. Yeah. It's, I've been I've been I've been a resource hound lately, um, but we can do this. Go ahead, you can keep talking. Um, and so we can just like you were alive in the '80s, and so you knew of Sam. I wasn't arcade ju- games. I wasn't just alive in the '80s. <laughs> I was living in the '80s. <laughs> There's a difference. Wow, was... you actually use those different menu screens? Heck yeah, man! <laughs> I I I oh I. Yeah, I, you're a, a um, productivity master. I I go crazy banana. I, I have certain things like I have it set up to open like these two messages and Discord open up on their own individual. Are um, these all panoramas? Yeah, I, I, I have them set to uh, to rotate on on a thirty minute basis as well. Oh, there's all sorts of things you could do, but but see how the the video the graphics get all all wonky. That mm-hmm. happens when I haven't uh, restarted my computer for a few days. That's weird. It's just it's a resource issue. I mean, it's like mm. you saw I had Premiere and Notion <laughs> yeah, and yeah, yeah. I had about 50 tabs open in Chrome. You know, uh-huh. it's like that's I'm I 
That's what I get. I, you know, <laughs> I asked for it. You, you're not using a mouse here. I have a mouse here, mm-hmm. and then this is this is just like I don't know what a trackpad. It's a magic. It's Apple's. I don't know what it is. It's a magic trackpad thing. Mm-hmm. And you, it's one of those things that once you start using it for a while, it's second nature. But I can't use it for everything. Mm. Uh, like I, I've given up my favorite video game for for uh, Lent, and hopefully for good. I keep trying to quit it because it's like I've been playing the same game for twelve years. Um, by the way, my password on my computer is the same password I set at that first CNMC that we talked about. <laughs> so it was it, it's the name of the guy who was using my computer that day. And, and so I said, here, I'll just change my password to your name. So you'll and then I just never I never changed it back. But that's not my like internet password. It's like uh-huh. you'd have to break into my house and you know and hop on your computer. And hop on my computer and all my that. mom did the same thing. One day we were at my grandma's house and I was we were trying to sign into her computer. And we were like, what's your password? And she's like, why don't you just change it? And so we changed it to a certain fruit name. <coughs> and it is still that certain fruit name. I got a better idea rather than doing this. So so we're gonna be we're gonna be doing something uh, on the screen. Yes. So you just want the screen recording. Yes. Okay. I got an easier way of doing that. All right. I'll just do it this way. Quick time player. Uh, just trust me, man. I'm telling you, I do this all the time. Is that a what kind of I, is that a Mac Studio? That is a Mac Studio. I'm so smart. I wish they they, they missed out on such an opportunity. They should have called it the Mac Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Why. I'm sure somebody floated that in the idea room, and and um, yeah. Tim Cook was just like, "Shut up, man." Yeah. So uh, where do you want me to go? In? Just look up free uh, arcade emulator with viruses, please. I mean, like online emulator? Yeah. Put to play it online. All right. I'm guessing. Okay. The least sketchy one. Uh, I, see, this is the. I don't think you play it online. I, I'm going to have to download like Mame or something like that. I'm assuming. Um. Do you want me to pick a game? Is that where we're going with this? All right. Um. How about you, just look up Tetris first? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're we'll go, go back from to, there. We're going to go back to Tetris. <laughs> Tetris free online. All right. And uh, because I did bring a very small Tetris game player, okay. All right, so here we go. Oh, I would play this all the time at school. I'm gonna get a new screen recording going here, and we'll just we'll just get it right. Do 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 do. That's Dallas. That's not Tetris, but it's close enough. Dallas theme song. Okay. Uh, and then I'll just record that. Awesome. Okay. And uh, so click. Should... There we go. Okay. So I'm assuming that. Doom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How do you turn? How do you? Uh... Are there instructions for pivoting it? Um, space bar maybe. Oh no, it's it's. it's... Oh okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. I gotta I gotta I gotta turn down the. Now the perfect thing about my podcast is that I decide to do um, activities with the guests, okay. which makes it really handy. For everybody listening at home, so that they'll be like, "Well, um, uh," and then they're just playing Tetris the whole time, yeah. and um, and so it it's it was a bad bad idea on my part, but now I feel like I can't change it because that's what I do. Well, I liked how uh, I watched your last one, and mm-hmm. and y'all were drawing. I mm-hmm. thought that that was interesting. Um, I think that. It does slow down the conversation a lot, mm-hmm. and and I I haven't listened to your podcast. I just uh, watched it, but you know, yeah, I don't I don't know how you overcome that now that you set it up because you're right. It, that I I was expecting some sort of activity, and then I, and then once we started talking, I forgot that that was a thing. Uh-huh. And so when you when you threw the the idea of playing Tetris at me, which I. I'm telling you, uh, I, well, number one, I'm breaking my Lenten fast right now by playing this game. I didn't think about that until just now either. So great. Now I have, I've, I've sinned on the podcast. So th- thank you for that. Um, but, uh, I can, yeah, I don't, I don't, I didn't need to know how easy this was. I can clip that. And uh, what the, Greg the, Willett sins on my podcast. <laughs> you just, just call the episode sinner. <laughs> Greg Willett's Mortal Sins and uh, Rosary Army yeah. or Tetris. Yeah. So do you, do you understand why I'm not closing off any of these things right now? Um, because you're waiting to get a bunch and then 
and then you you move over to the end. Yeah, like right here. I was waiting. I was waiting for this guy. Mm -hmm. And watch. Oh, it's so satisfying. Whoa. Now I'm just gonna. Now I'm, uh, that that only happens a few times, but <laughs> I'm gonna uh, just clear some of these out. So, was there an arcade by your house when you were younger? There was not a dedicated arcade, but when I when I was in elementary school, there's a place down the street called Flags um, Wine and and Liquor Store, and they wow. let they, they let kids in it. And and, uh -huh. and again, and, and at this time in the uh, so the first arcade I ever went into was here in Atlanta. Uh, it was over at South Cab Mall, and it was a place called Barrel of Fun. And literally the entrance <laughs> the, the, the entrance to it was like a great big uh, oak barrel. So it was like a round entrance, and you go into it and and they had at that time. There's the only games were like Space Invaders and and pixel games, pixel based games, like Asteroids and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And Miss Pac or uh, Pac Man didn't come out, and others didn't come out for about another year or so. Uh, and by that time, we'd moved to Ohio, and we were living in Columbus. And Flags um, was down at the Scioto View Pharmacy uh, shop, or Scioto View uh, Shopping Center, and we went in there. And one day, we'd go in there and get soft drinks or whatever. And one day, we walked in, and they had uh, a video game. There and I believe the first one they got was Vanguard, which mm. was which was pretty awesome. And um, they'd switch it out every few months, but we were never allowed to. Uh, my parents didn't want us wasting money on on video games, and you know, rightfully so because it's like back then. I mean, they're still most of them are a quarter when you come across them, but back mm -hmm. then it was like yeah, that was a lot of money. You're putting out a quarter, <laughs> and most of those games were kind of hard. You yeah. couldn't you couldn't make some of these games last for uh, you know longer than 5 minutes. And mm -hmm. you you'd go through your three lives and it's like, well, that that that's my allowance for the week. Um <laughs> but uh so we'd go down to Flags and then there was like a there was a river nearby and there was a little bait store and they sometimes would get they had like Berserk mm -hmm. and Robotron and they had an Asteroids game and so we'd go over there sometimes. So so at that time when when a place got a video game. Mhm. Mm all the kids knew that that place had that video game and mm. we we'd go there all the time and then sometimes you know they they'd have a game and we'd all get addicted to it like there was one game called uh, Quix Q I X awesome game and all flags had that and we we all loved that and we walked in one day and it was gone we're like what pingo why do they got pingo now <laughs> what the heck is pingo it's like well pingo was actually a pretty cool game too i i was better at pingo than i was at at quix mm -hmm. um but you know at Back then, it was going to – if you wanted to go to a genuine arcade, you normally had to go to like a shopping mall in a lot of places. Mm. And the shopping malls always had an arcade inside. And so it was like, you know, the idea of like now if your mom said, hey, do you want to go shopping with me? It's like, nah, not particularly. <laughs> uh, but back then, it was like, you know, I'm going to go to the mall. You want to go, yeah! <laughs> and you're like trying to find – you know, you're, you're putting together all the nickels you could find so that you could go and like, you know, cash it in for a quarter, just uh -huh. one quarter, just so I could play one game. And you, mm -hmm. you walk around trying to pick the game. Um, one of the coolest things was, uh, you know, after, after arcades have been out for a few years – when uh, the summer between seventh and eighth grade for me, so that would have been um, 1984, um, we had moved to South Carolina uh, just earlier that summer, and we were living in this cabin while our house was being built. And at that time, it was just me and one of my brothers. Uh, we were the only kids left at home, and I, I think that we were my brother and I were driving my mom nuts. And uh, so my dad was would come over to Atlanta on business, mm -hmm. uh, and so we. Drove over here. I, you know, my dad brought me so that we could, he could get me away from my my brother and give my mom a break, and stayed in a hotel. And every time we pass this place, by the way, I tell my kids this story like every time. <laughs> They've heard this story so many times because uh -huh. the summer of '84, the Olympics were happening in um, over in Los Angeles. McDonald's had an amazing promotion where every time you went to McDonald's and you'd buy these uh buy anything they'd give you this, these little cards the scratch off cards and you'd scratch it off and it would have the name of an event an olympic event mm. and the date on it and if if the uh united states team scored gold in that event that card would be worth a big mac <gasps> and if they scored a silver it was worth fries and if they scored a bronze <laughs> you got a drink uh -huh. And my dad and I are staying in a hotel, and we're basically getting like the McGriddle meal every breakfast, uh -huh. you know, like the hot cakes and sausage from McDonald's. And he come back to the hotel with a couple of cards. And I mean, I literally had a stack of cards. So that <laughs> so so I'm staying in this hotel a lot that summer with him. And then uh, right right around that hotel, there was this there was an amazing arcade at the time, just a little little 
you know, square cinder block building that they, they just a, a strong wind probably could have knocked this thing over. But uh-huh. um, I, I discovered this place. It's like didn't even have really a good sign. It's like just people just knew it was there. And I walked in and you could uh, get 10 tokens for a dollar. <gasps> Normally it's like you, know, you get four. Yeah. You get 10 tokens for a dollar. I'm like, so every day. <laughs> my my dad would go get the breakfast. Uh huh. <clears throat> We'd eat. He'd he'd leave. Go go work. I'd hang around the hotel. I might go swimming. I'd read. That arcade opened up at eleven. Go in, cash in a dollar, play my games, my ten games, and then I'd walk over to that McDonald's with whatever tickets I had, mm-hmm. and I would trade it in and get my lunch. And then they'd give me more tickets. <laughs> it's like I'd use my tickets. They'd give me more tickets, and uh-huh. I just, that's how I kept getting more and more of them. So anyway, that was. That arcade was probably the best arcade just because of the uh, the ten dollar deal. I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> that never happens when I record. It must be a barren thing. Yeah, because your parents it, sneeze it all really the time. Is. My mom has the most earth shattering mm-hmm. sneezes. Like I swear, you can hear it. It's like a gunshot. Now, if I was your dad, what would I have done just now when I sneezed? Uh, you would have done it. 12 more times. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Mac. Uh-huh. Your son knows you well. <laughs> you know, I I I see a lot of Tommy's mannerisms in you. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Like the like some of the ways he talks and some of the just the phrases or like body language he uses. That's funny. Yeah. Don't it's... don't tell him that cuz then he'll <laughs> he'll stop doing it. Uh-huh. Um he probably would be horrified to hear you say that. I don't know if he would find that as a compliment or not. Do you know? Have you noticed any of that? Like you copying your dad's mannerisms? Yeah, yeah. Um, like it, it's it. Well, I don't know if it's a mannerism as much as it is a. Uh, it's a vocal tone, mm. like um, surprise when something funny or, or surprising happens. Uh, really really <laughs> it's like my it, it, that comes out and i'll go ah, that's not just like my dad uh-huh. like, you know and um you know and and some of it also because you, you know you do this it's like you, you notice things that your parents do right mm-hmm. and then you start joking about it right it, it becomes it, 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 an inside joke with like be, just you or just you or, or you even even with your parents yeah. or, or with your siblings right but then that inside joke becomes a real thing Mm -hmm. right and so then it becomes and 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 y'all always talk about you know your family shorthand little little phrases and things that you just say that really only your family would get that kind Mm -hmm. of thing and i think that there's a lot of that and 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 that problem my dad doesn't know that he has said things that that we have appropriated into (laughs) our (coughs) regular vernacular Uh um that even even like I've said it enough around your parents that even your dad has like <laughs> your dad has has quoted my father uh-huh. uh, and and my father wouldn't even know that he he said those things. Um, so I my dad, uh, it's a joke in our family that my dad sighs when he's yeah yeah yeah. But it's it's become the dad sigh. All right. So whenever you're dissatisfied with with how something's going, you or, just go, or it's gone on too long. Yeah. And that tells everyone. Yeah. And like my dad really gets frustrated with very consistent annoying noises like Yeah. like that he, he has a very low tolerance for that. Yeah. So one of the reasons why And ironically, ironically though, he would love to do that to other people. <laughs> he 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 gets so annoyed at things that he does to mm-hmm. annoy people. Mm-hmm. You do, Mac. You do. <laughs> Um, but one of the reasons why I left Express. Oh, you did. I didn't. I didn't realize you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I are you at, not? Are you working now? Yeah, I work at Banana Republic. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's just, no, go ahead. Explain the laugh. I, I've just always found Banana Republic to be a funny name, and <laughs> and and it's like, oh, we're going to open up a boutique clothing store. <laughs> what are we going to call it? Banana Republic. <laughs> I did. I um. I like to doodle on sticky notes at work. And one time, I made one where there's one banana, and there's a bunch of bananas below it. Mm. And they said, "We should vote." <laughs> it's a banana republic. Oh. Um. But one of the reasons why I left Express is because every twenty minutes, every twenty minutes, 
there would be one of four ads for working at Express. Oh. And I can recite to you uh, all of them. Ah, no, oh, that was close. Did how, you did, even see? how did you manage that? I, I don't know. That my brain, my brain was working over time. <laughs> I may not be able to answer any other questions at this point. <laughs> <laughs> all right, go ahead. Um, but one of them was, we know you like shopping at Express, but have you ever thought about working at Express? Well, now's oh, the time because good. we're hiring. Talk to our store manager today. You sound like you've heard that a few times. I've I would hear it 18 times every shift. You count I, it. You count I, it. I worked there for four months. Well, it's every 20 minutes, and, yeah. and I, I would work six-hour shifts. So Okay. Um, but I would be like, this is one of the reasons why I don't like working here. And my man, everyone else would be like, oh, I taunt it out. I'm like, well, because you don't have Mac Barron as your father. Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> well, because things like that, like he would, if he ever worked at Express, he would leave almost instantly because of how annoying the music and things like that are. Like, he would despise it. Mm. That's what I told him when I started working. I was like, Dad, you would hate working there. Because cause the music, and and this is sort of similar at Banana, too. I don't even uh, know come what, on, I, Greg. I don't even know what just happened. Um, uh, I screwed up. I'm, uh, this game is... This, <laughs> I, uh, see, this is Come where on, it, don't give up. I, there you go. It's going to, oh, see, I lost an opportunity right there. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Everything is going down now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just, why even bother it at this point? <sighs> Did you have, like, competitions at the arcade? Nah. No? I mean, well, other than the, by default, you know, every arcade machine had a high score listed yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> nah, that's, it's, it's done, man. It's done. Did the, did the character with the highest high score was like, like a legend to you? If he had like a super high score, you'd be like, "Whoa!" Who's no, Max? because because who's Max? <laughs> Your dog. Yeah, <laughs> Your well, dog. that's a that's a Stranger Things reference. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, all right. So there, that you get to do this, right? That was it. And who's Gloa? <laughs> all right. Whoa, Gloa. Sorry, are you gonna play now? Yes. Uh, sorry, it took me so long. <laughs> Toe up from the flow up. So you have to. Oh wait, and now we get an ad. Yes. Because the economy today. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made off of Tetris, man. Mm-hmm. All right. Skirt, skirt. All that right. was fun. Ah, uh, dang it. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit rusty. Okay. It's up you don't have down. to use space. You, you can uh, all arrows. And then when you want it to go down, you can just do the lower arrow too. I know, but like I like making it go down instantly. Oh, well. Do you get extra points for that? Uh, no, I just think it's, it's fun. It's satisfying. I would play this all the time. I'm not sure if it was at Bosco or at um, like North or something, but I vividly remember playing this every time I had free time at school on a Chromebook. I'm I'm. Did 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 you like? Did you have a bad experience with my keyboard? Because you're awfully angry at it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just I'm just very focused. I gotta. Here, I'll I'll be more polite it's, to it's, it. It's like it seems like you're you're punishing my keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? I mean, it is a Logitech, so it's like at least it's a good keyboard, you know. Have you tried clicky clicky keyboards? Are you not a fan of those? I, I just haven't tried them, and and they probably would bother me For, from a writing perspective. Mm. I, when I when I'm writing, I there's a, a few different types of things I like to listen to that put me in the the zone, and uh, I. I I don't know. I, I always make fun of Jennifer. She's a very aggressive typer, mm-hmm. and she's had key, computers in the past where, like, I could hear her on the other side of the house. And she's just <laughs> like, you know, it just sounds like she's typing angry. It's like, dear father, I just want to let you know how much I enjoyed your homily. Just like, you know, it's like it's very angry sounding typing going on. Mm-hmm. Um. I, you know, I have typewriters. I'm an avid typewriter fan. Oh yeah, I've been, I've actually been on in the market. I've been looking for one myself for a, for, really? for a while. I'm, well, I'm quite picky. I, I wrote an entire novel uh, when I was 22 on an on electric typewriter. Well, you're in luck because I have a typewriter that I was going to send to Matt Frad, but I just never ended up doing it because it would have been like forty dollars. So, <laughs> if you want it, what kind is it? It is a Royal Quiet Deluxe. I'd totally be open to looking at it, man. It's got a new ribbon in it too. Oh, totally! I'd love to. I'd love to see it. Oh, man. Well, just th- this weekend we went to. Uh, th- there's the monthly 
flea market nearby us. Um, and uh, oh, that was a good one. Um, and I went looking for typewriters. Mm. Saw one. It was just a junked up. It's like, well, that's there if you want to fix it up. I'm like, I'm like don't want to fix up a typewriter. I like fixing up typewriters. Um, I The first two I got were my mom came to school one day. This is like when I was like 15. And she she picked me up from school and in the back seat were two typewriters that she found at a oh man flea market. And she was like, here, you you get to choose and then we'll sell the other one. And one of them worked and one didn't. And uh, the the one that worked was uh, the Royal Quiet Deluxe that I was, I'm going to give you. Um, but... Ah, uh, sorry. The Tetris is is too um. <laughs> um, but I never ended up selling the other one, and I tried to fix it, but the the platen was broken, the thing that rolls the paper, mm. and that is really hard to fix. Um, the little rubber things were too, because if if you leave it like compressed for a long time, then the the rubber will get worn out, and um, it is not not a good thing. So. I still have that one, and it's a very pretty one, so I would sell it being like, hey, you can't use this, but it looks nice. Um, Did you know Tom Hanks is a typewriter aficionado? I, I very much do, actually. I did a lot of research. Um, I do I do that a lot whenever I'm very interested in something. I just, every YouTube video on the subject, every, um, every podcast, every everything... Yeah, podcast listener of ours actually sent me um, money for my birthday a couple years ago <laughs> wow. to buy a typewriter, and I've just kind of been searching ever since, and I've just never have done it. Oh, but you still have the money? No, I spent it on something. <laughs> it got, it, I, I, anytime someone gives me money or a gift card, I just give it to Jennifer. Like it's it's going to get put to better use in her hands than in my own, and I always feel weird buying stuff for myself, even mm. even when someone gives me the money to do it. Well, you pay me what that guy gave you, and I'll give you that typewriter. <laughs> I think it was the equivalent of a post-it note, uh, since oh. you said you love post-it notes. Um, you, it seems like every time I I come downstairs after hanging out with Tommy, you're you always talk about a job you had, like like you're. Your history is is filled to the brim with jobs that you've had. Yeah. How many jobs have you had? Oh, that's a great question. I've never counted them up. Should we do that now? Would that yes. Be, would yeah, that yeah, be yeah. fascinating? Super I mean, like, fascinating. And, and we're talking about from the very beginning, right? Mm-hmm. Does it do, does the job uh, need to require receiving a paycheck, or do things like babysitting and all that kind of stuff? Uh, as long as you get money for it, okay. I think that that counts. Wow. Okay. So so I'm gonna I'm gonna. I, I, okay, I'm, I'm just going to put miscellaneous childhood stuff, right? So, I mean, my brother and I, for example, one point, uh, this was my brother's idea. It was a great idea. So this is when the Atari 2600 came out. Mm-hmm. You know what the 2600 is? The original Atari with just like you had yeah, yeah, one yeah. button and the knob. And uh, we uh, we wanted one of these things, and we went to the store and bought a bunch of uh, stencils, number stencils, mm. and made a rectangular stencil. And we bought a can of white paint and a can of black spray paint. And my brother cobbled together a box. And he had a moped at the time. And so we went all around these neighborhoods. And in the area that we lived, people had their addresses painted on the curbs. Mm-hmm. And so we'd go and look for the ones that needed to be touched up or repainted. And we'd charge them five bucks. And we'd go. And so, like, my hands were covered in paint for two weeks. Just we'd do the white, whoosh, you know put down there and then spray paint the black on there and get five bucks a pop we'd be done in five or ten minutes and we went all over the place i had my fr- I, th- i'll put this i'm not gonna put babysitting and raking leaves i used to do whatever i had to do to make some money when i was a kid mm-hmm. my first my first real job i think i got it in fourth grade might have been at the end of third grade but i had a paper out um i delivered papers for the columbus dispatch newspaper in columbus ohio and that was that was a legitimate thing i mean in fourth grade, I had uh, there was one point where I had every Star Wars action figure available at that time, <laughs> and I bought most of them myself with my paper out money. I bought my own motorcycle when I was like in fifth or sixth grade. Wow! Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, paper out money. I was making about forty bucks a month when I was in elementary school, and that was pretty good back then. Yeah, um, had a good, good amount of money. Uh, so, so the paper out, and then I would say that my first real like. You know, I where I was had a timesheet and all that kind of stuff was I worked at Wendy's. Um, 
after Wendy's, I uh, got a job. I was assistant manager. I, I, I moved up to assistant manager at, at a big and tall store. And I did that. That was a great job. I had that at the end of high school, beginning of college. Great boss, Nick. Um, if we weren't busy, I could do all my homework sitting in the back and, <laughs> nice. and uh, read books. And, and Nick and I literally had a stack of paperbacks that he'd buy a paperback sometimes and I'd have it. I'd read one and we'd just leave it on, on, the, on the bookshelf in the back because eventually that place went out of business. Mm. You know, surprise, surprise. Um, after, after that big and tall store went out of business, I uh, got a job at a bookstore. And that was only a couple months. And then I worked at another clothing store. Um, which that lasted two weeks. I went, I don't want to do this. And then I spent two years working at a comic book store and a uh, comic book and baseball card store. And that was, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so after the comic store, I started waiting tables and I, and I'll just put restaurant one, restaurant two. So these are all before I actually got a career. So that was restaurant one, restaurant two. Um, and then things got sketchy i went out to california for a few months and uh, wow and, and i worked in a restaurant out there um Are you trying to make it big and well no it was northern california i wanted uh, to write mm-hmm. and, and and i that that's actually where i started getting my first paid i was a i was a contractor but i i, I did some uh newspaper writing so mm. so i'll put newspaper down there um went back and then i worked at a copy store i worked at kinko's and then i worked at another one called pit printing you know what Kinko's is? Kinko's used to be huge. FedEx bought them. Mm. Um, and then I moved back to Georgia after that. And then that's when I actually got hired at a newspaper. Um, and I was a, a full-time staff writer for a local local newspaper and did that for several months. Went back to uh, college. I worked at another restaurant for a while. And then I then then and then finally I started getting some actual real jobs. So those are all just the random jobs I had for, for many years. <laughs> Uh-huh. And so then I worked for a big advertising firm called BBDO in their accounting department. And then I worked there for just a little under a year until I got my first um, IT job. And I worked for Lotus Software doing um, a technical support for them and learned all about it, doing tech support on the phone and learning about every type of software you can imagine. So they, so they, they're the original um, spreadsheet they had lotus mm. lotus one two three and microsoft excel is very much based off of lotus one two three mandy patankin you know who he is Inigo Matoya gave him tech support one time he called in he was switching really? from lotus one two three to uh microsoft excel when he called in so the name would pop up on the screen and it said on the screen mandy patankin <laughs> and i'm like what and i, I get, uh, hi my name is uh thank you for calling lotus tech support my name is greg may i have your name please this is mandy i said mandy patankin he goes yes seriously y- yes I, and so at that time, I, I'd seen him on Letterman <laughs> several times, and he sings. Uh-huh. And I said, sing something. No kidding. I don't know where, how I got that courage to say that, right? <laughs> uh, th- this could have gotten me in trouble. Yeah. Ma- Mandy Patinkin on the phone sang for me. He, 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 he sang, <laughs> somewhere over the rainbow. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. Okay. How can I help you? To this day, kick myself in the butt. I should have said, say the line. Say the line. <laughs> say the line. Say it. I've, I've missed the opportunity to have him say, my name is Nico Montoya. Uh-huh. You killed my father. Prepare to die. But I missed that opportunity. Instead, I had him sing Over the Rainbow. Um, so that Lotus Software was great. Uh, that was right when uh, websites were taking off. And I taught myself how to make websites. So I actually had a side business uh, for websites for uh, in the mid '90s, and that's when people considered it like voodoo magic. Mm. If you could somehow take my idea and my photograph and put it on the internet, and I could see it, mm-hmm. I mean, people just—how do you do that, right? Mm-hmm. And so I did. A, I did a lot of side work for a while. This is really boring, by the way, going through all my my jobs. Uh, uh, I, it's so someone listening right now is very bored. But then Lotus <laughs> Mac Baron, my dad. Yeah, yeah, this is where he's. Like, <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> this uh-huh. is this is that repeating noise that uh-huh. he gets tired of. So then it was a series of of IT jobs, and I don't know if I can remember them all, but um, uh, they it was great because in the in the late nineties there was a lot of money to be made in IT before that IT bubble burst, mm. and then it started going back backwards a little bit. But I mean, I I jumped up, I kept doubling my salary and doubling my salary and doubling my salary, and and it just it. It was amazing for someone who only has an associate's degree from college. I mean, I went to college for six years, but I only have a two-year degree, so go figure. Yeah. Um, so obviously, I'm not good at math either. Um, <laughs> but the the fact that I was able to do this kind of stuff, you know, hard work and and giving up a lot of weekends to learn things, got me there. 
Um, so from Sundata, and then I went from Sundata to uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, which is a, a huge firm, and I traveled a lot for them. Mm. I commuted from Atlanta to Sioux Falls, South Dakota uh, every every week. And I did that for about six months, and I went, I'm not doing this anymore. I had a, I had a baby at home. Uh-huh. Um, I, I literally was home for about 48 hours a week, and I said, I can't wow. do that. Um, so from there, then I got the job at USI, and then I got a job at Harlan Clark, which is a Czech company, and, and that, that was a great job. And I'm still friends with people that I worked with at Harlan. I was working at Harlan when 9-11 happened, oh, wow. and, and um, that was a very, you know, you get connected to um, – the people that you know you were with that day, and I, it was a very weird, weird thing. Yeah. So from Harland, um, after Harland, I worked. I, I got to start working from home, uh, and then I went to go work for um, another company uh, that was a, took me about an hour to get to every day, and then and then that's when I started working doing Rosier Army full time, mm. and then uh, I worked for Sirius XM for four years, and then after Sirius XM, I went to Denver. And then I worked for uh, that Catholic publisher that won't be named in Indiana, and then back here and doing Rosie Army. And then there's been lots of side jobs in between, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's like I've done audio books and you know a lot of other consulting and that type of thing. But so, but these are actual jobs where I've, I got a paycheck. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight, to my, best of my memory. Wow, that is a long resume. Yeah, I only point out the last three in my resume, <laughs> but they don't they don't care about all that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. I used to put all the tech stuff. I I, I kind of I'll, I'll put a summary now and say it also has ten years of you know project management, software development management experience, and you should put over a decade. That sounds yeah, bigger. Over a decade, yeah. yeah. I learned that on some business. Man, that was thing. that was almost. That was painful for me to to, to, to lay all that out. <laughs> to pull all yeah. the way back. Yeah. But I mean, it's like, it, you know, comic book stores and printing and it, it's, I'm, I'm always very grateful for the, um, the, the experience. I do wish that I wasn't quite the jack of all trades. I, w- I wish I was super focused on something, right? Mm-hmm. I wish I had, you know, like I have friends that, that got degrees, like I think about Again, at Harland, a lot of people that I worked with there, I mean, I was a software development manager. These other guys were programmers. They were so tone, uh, uh, tuned in to what they were doing as, as programmers. I heard this one kid straight out of college whose name was Webb. <laughs> Did web development. His name was Webb. Mm-hmm. Webb is now a co-founder of a fairly significant uh, tech company here in the Atlanta area, doing fantastic. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, but he – he had he trained for that in college, and then he went and did it for. I mean, he's and and so his tech skills are just excellent. You know, yeah. to have that firm understanding to specialize in something. I wish I could specialize in something, and I guess I have. I mean, I I can hold my own and talking about the faith mm-hmm. left and right. Um, I can find resources very quickly. I can I can explain things pretty well. It's not going to necessarily you know help me retire someday. Yeah. Um, and so that's. You know, I've chosen a different path of of uh, you know, even though you know, super nice looking studio or whatever, I tend to invest um, a lot of money in, in doing the things for the now, and that that don't necessarily, you know, support our family in the long run. But what I found is that um, the more we just keep investing in in sharing the faith with other people, God has never let us down. Mm-hmm. Um, it's amazing. We we always get our mortgage paid. We all you know. We may not get to go on as many vacations as we would like, and and uh, but you know, I feel like we have a lot more nice stuff than we deserve. Um, but it also comes at a lot of a lot of risk and, mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of responsibility too. Like I feel a huge responsibility to this this studio mm-hmm. and to use it for good and to um, use it a lot to share our faith with people and to help people realize just how much. Um, I needed another cup of coffee, and uh, how much Jesus loves them. And, and in, in today's world, it's like, you know, just yesterday, I saw, I just, I see people arguing online all the time, and just people denying the existence of God, and and it just makes me so sad um, because there's so much joy that can come from it. And again, you know, you you know this from from knowing our family and probably from hearing your parents talk about it, but it's like you know. As someone who suffers from depression and anxiety and those kinds of things, and, and quite honestly, has experienced a tremendous amount of healing in the last few years, mm-hmm. I, I could not imagine 
life without God. I could not imagine life without my Savior. And and I don't just say that from some sort of I, I literally need someone to save me, and and God has done that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, for as sinful as I was in my youth, and for as as you know wayward as I was, I mean, we didn't even talk about you know in the '70s and '80s we talked about video games, but it's like it was just a stupid time in the church. Things uh-huh. are stupid now. Mm-hmm. I mean, the catechesis that we got was was non-existent. I was in my twenties, married, and with a kid before I ever had any. In all these places that I've lived, I've lived in eight different states in my life. I've lived all over the place. I never had until my late twenties. I was never introduced to Eucharistic adoration. It never was talked about in any parish I went to. Wow! It, it never was brought up, and it was just this. We it's like Catholicism became loosey goosey and stupid, mm-hmm. and that's why there's this this you know. Exodus of people that have left because we didn't have guardians that would were willing to stand up for the faith mm-hmm. and that would defend it and explain it and protect it. And when I discovered this truth that was sitting there the whole time, and the truth never left, mm-hmm. it was just we we lost the defenders of the truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that uh, you know that did something to me. And <laughs> spending time with Jesus in, in the in you know adoration that that is where all this desire to serve him comes from and the willingness to to give up um all sorts of other things you know just you know just recently you know heard of of you know people just you know like we, we had we had someone just this past year for um Roger Army that gave a significant amount of money mm-hmm. to help this apostle keep going and i think wow i just can't imagine having i'm i'm talking tens of thousands of dollars yeah uh to have that amount of money to just give away you know, to someone else, but that's not what God called me to do. Mm-hmm. God called me to 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 be a worker out in the field, and other people have have the blessings of being able to do those kinds of things, and they're responsible for being wise stewards and, and doing that. But I, I can't imagine being that kind of businessman that you know starts businesses and sells them and has a lot of extra capital and can help and philanthropic. You know, mm-hmm. I'd love to do that. You know, every time I bought a lottery ticket, I just have these grandiose <laughs> visions. I don't think about all the things I'm going to buy uh-huh. other than like the typical, you know, like pay off the house and that kind of thing. But I always think I would love to start a Catholic foundation that would help other uh, Catholic nonprofits like Rosary Army get their feet yeah. and their foundation solid and create endowments uh, for Catholic organizations versus just giving, t- you know, Ten thousand dollars to a group, I would love to be able to establish something that's like, let's talk about the the nonprofit you're tr- trying to start up, what your focus is going to be, how you're going to serve people, and then create an endowment which they could then draw funds off of every year. Or just keep it's sort of like an investment that uh, generates operating capital, and I, that's that's my daydream for a, a lottery win. You know, it's like to ha- be able to establish all these endowments. I think that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, years ago, um, this this probably was about ten years ago now. I think. Um, the nephew of Margaret Mitchell, do you know who Margaret Mitchell is? <coughs> Wrote Gone with the Wind. Mm. The 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 nephew of Margaret Mitchell died. And he was one of the two owners of of all of the Margaret Mitchell estate, including Gone with the Wind's copyrights and all that kind of stuff. So every time, you know, TNT or some cable network pay, plays it, you know, money was being given. Yeah. He donated his um, his chunk of Gone with the Wind to the Archdiocese of Atlanta. Really? And so it was a huge amount of money. Yeah. And the Archbishop at that time uh, took some of it and was going to use it not the best ways, but then, th- but one of the ways he was going to use it was he created, I think, like a $10,000 endowment for every parish in the, in the Archdiocese. Wow. So that's just $10,000 that's perpetually being reinvested and then a little bit can be taken off of every year and be yeah. just using for the operating capital of the parish. I love that idea. Uh-huh. I love that idea, you know, <laughs> creating like a million dollar endowment or something like that mm-hmm. so that that money can just co- constantly be brought out and be, and so I probably am not using the word endowment correctly or or there's probably <laughs> so, there's probably all all sorts of other logistical things that have to be done but um anyway. All right. Well, Greg Willits Thank you for being on gonna, the show. We're going to end on my lottery daydreams? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I would have picked a better subject had I known that was the last <laughs> thing that we were going to talk about. No, it's great. Well, thank you for having me, man. Of I, course. I, I really, I, I think it's neat you're doing this. Um, I, I I hope that it finds the, uh, the audience it deserves. And and uh, can I ask you a question before we wrap Sure, up? yeah. What's, what's your biggest um, growth point in doing this so far? I know you've only done a handful of episodes, but what... What's what's been changing in you since you've been doing it? I mean, mostly it's it's an 
opportunity to just do work to like mm. do something and then have it have it be like hey i'm doing this look i can show you what i've been doing but it's it's also about how i talk to people now like mm. i'm i'm much more inquisitive and it's all about like i'm really way better at asking questions That's and awesome. I, I really enjoy that like i love being able to do that well you're doing a great job i'm proud of you thank you you know, I've known you for a long time. I was gonna find some old Sam Barron <laughs> pictures, and uh-huh. I, was, I was just gonna put a, I was gonna put a, a Sam a Sam Barron baby show up on the on the TV, and I just didn't get a chance. To ah, so. all right. Well, thanks, sir. Good luck, Charlie. Okay, that's how I end every episode. Oh, oh. Charlie bit my finger. <laughs>